Coming up on the Branding Deep Dive Podcast. People of the big and tall size don't like going to malls. Why? Because when they go to malls, there's kids there and kids make fun of them. So they like coming to downtown stores where there's not many people around and they can comfortably shop. So you brand yourself to make sure people like that come in. So you have all mm. sizes. And the guy beside us, his store was called Mr. K Big and Tall. He was selling suits for big and tall men. We were selling shirts and pants and shorts for all sized men. This is Ahmed Shima and welcome to the Branding Deep Dive podcast. If you're new here, this is a podcast where we have in-depth discussions about what brands are doing well to drive customer loyalty and how you can take those principles and apply them to your own brand. Today we're talking to Asad Patel. Asad has been involved in running brick and mortar businesses since he was a child. Amongst other things, he's run a clothing store, a cell phone store, and a food truck. In this episode, we dive deep into the various businesses that he's been a part of and the branding lessons he's learned along the way. If you have a brick and mortar business of your own, you're going to want to take a second to grab a pen and paper so you can take notes. Now, here's Asad Patel. Asaf, hi, welcome to the show. It is an honor to have you here. Uh, for the audience that doesn't know who you are, can you briefly give an introduction to who you are uh, and uh, a little bit about the topic that we're talking about today as well? Okay. Uh, my name is Asad Patil. I was born and raised in Gastonia, North Carolina. Uh, a lot of people, they ask me, you know, where are you from? That's, you know, one of the first questions I get as I'm visibly brown living in the deep south. Uh I, I usually have to inform them much to their shock that, yes, I was born here. Um, I come from a, a Gujarati Muslim family, and my dad's been in Gastonia for like close to like 46 plus years. And, you know, I do I do a few things. I operate a business. I work for an NGO. And I also work with Ahmed on Falcon Notes. Um, as you can see, he's wearing a Falcon Notes uh what's it called pullover so you know there's a few things which i do and you know i try to do community work as well this is something i've been doing community work for many many years now um and that's basically a brief explanation i'm also a father and a husband and a son you know as far as the business goes i work with my father and today's topic what we're talking about is uh branding operating a business in brick and mortar which is yeah let, let me that's fine. Fine. let me cut you off here for a second that's fine. one thing he didn't mention Asadbhai is a prolific podcaster as well. So he has Straight Path podcast. He's on the Forget Wolves podcast. He, al he also has an Urdu podcast called Kahani Apni Zabani, where he talks about uh, just the journey of being a Muslim American, Pakistani Muslim American. Yeah. Uh, and so check out his stuff if you're, um, I think you'll enjoy it. If you enjoy this episode, check it out. But that's why let's, uh, let's get into it. Um, yeah. When we were talking about this, episode, one of the things we talked about, you kind of shared your story uh, and yeah. how you got into business more, even before you got into business, how your dad got into business, yeah. right? So let's start there. And then my plan is let's go through your, you know, give the audience the whole context of yeah. how you guys uh, operated business and what that looked like. And then let's dive into some of the lessons we've learned throughout the, uh, okay. the years. So, so my dad, he was born in Karachi, Pakistan in 1957. He left home in 1973 at the age of 16. Um, back in the day, people would try to send their children off to different countries to make something happen because the prospectus in these countries wasn't very good, especially if you had more than three or four kids. So my daddy went to Panama um, and he stayed there. He was there for a period of like three years or so. And one of the first things which he had to do was learn Spanish, which he said wasn't a hard language to learn. He learned Spanish. His uncle used to live there. So he went there to live with his uncle. He learned Spanish. And most of the Gujarati businessmen out there, they do what's called ferry. That's what they call it in Urdu or Gujarati. But it, it generally translates to door-to-door -door sales. So mm -hmm. he learned how to do door-to-door -door sales. And one of the things which he said is, you know, they used to do back in the day, which he really didn't like. He's like, but that was the best way to do it is they would take candles and they would sell candles. And when they would go to somebody's house to sell this candle, they would ask, like, why should I buy this candle? You would tell them, well, this candle will bring you good luck or this candle will bring you blessings into your house. 
And this is how, you know, you learn how to sell candles. And he's like, you know, we used to sell a lot of candles, a lot of, you know, different, different things. But you had to teach people the benefit of the item of why you should mm-hmm. buy from them. And, and that does teach you a branding lesson of your branding yourself and your branding your items in a very subtle way of this is why this item will bring you benefit. It's like, for example, if you have water, um, if you go to Walmart, for example, there's like distilled water, there's spring water, there's water, they say, with reverse osmosis. And now they explain all the water, why it's so beneficial to you. Now, if somebody buys, you know, I'm drinking water right here. Somebody, you know, drinks Pure Life by Nestle. It'd be like, okay, why should I drink this? And it tells you why. It's enhanced with minerals. Oh, you're drinking the same thing. Now, now before the episode, I did something on purpose is I brought another brand of water, Pure Aqua. It's some local brand um, from Little or Aldi or something like that. You have that as well? Mark. Oh, that'd be, that'd be crazy. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at that before the episode, actually. Members Mark at one point in time, actually, used to be more expensive than the Nestle water at Sam's Club. Used to be able to oh, get really? the Nestle bottles for cheaper, but people would buy the Members Mark water to resell because they would think it's cheaper. Not looking at the <laughs> actual price of, you know, for example, this is for like eight cents and that was for seven cents. But they would think just because it's branded as the generic cheaper brand, people would buy it for that purpose. And then they would wow. resell it in the oh, gas station. Oh, my stores. goodness. That's, so, so that's crazy. Hold on. Let's, let's stop yeah. there. So okay. you're saying that people had this perception in their mind that yeah. Members Mark water is cheaper. And yeah. so without even looking at the price, they just bought it because they thought it was cheaper and they're using that yeah. to resell versus using Nestle, which in, Nestle, in that which moment a, was actually cheaper. Yeah, which actually even in my opinion tastes better. Um, now, now another thing is if you have, for example, you know, we do brick and mortar, I don't want to jump around, but this is something I want to, well, since we're on this, if you go into Sam's club, a lot of times, like we used to do a project where we used to feed homeless people, we would buy stuff from Sam's club. I bought stuff from Sam's club for the first few times, but what I realized is even with my tax exempt status, if I went to Walmart and I paid tax on those same items, the same brands, and I got them. I was paying $10 less on close to like $100 worth of stuff, even with tax. Mm. So really, even if you're I, buying in bulk, even if you're buying in bulk, you're paying less at Walmart for the same amount of items. Wow. So, so and they the same branded items themselves. Too. So they branded themselves as the wholesale, wholesale place, but even without tax as a tax exempt business, I was paying more there or a tax exempt organization working through the religious place. I was paying more there than if I went to Walmart and bought the same amount of items. I was paying less. So it just goes to show you brick and mortar is like, you know, it's really complicated. It's not really simple. It's about how you branded yourself. People think just because you're buying in wholesale, you're going to get it cheaper. But sometimes if you look around, you can buy it in retail and still get it cheaper. And there's a, there's a lot of Pakistani businessmen um, who, who operate gas stations. When when they buy Coke and Pepsi for their gas station, they don't buy from Sam's. They buy from the grocery store. Sam's will sell a bottle, for example, for like 99 cents, a bottle for the two liter. You can go to the grocery store and get it for 89 cents. Mm. With tax, that comes out to 91 cents. Food tax in North Carolina is 2 cents. I mean, sorry, 2%. So it comes out to 91 cents. You're still saving 8 cents per bottle. So right, let, me, let me stop yeah. you. You're going too quick, man. So sorry. first yeah. thing. First thing I want the audience to make sure that yeah. we're getting here is that, so Asabai's dad, he moved to Panama, learned Spanish, and was going door to door doing yeah. sales. And I think one of the things that when people are starting yeah. businesses online, especially, yeah. there's this fallacy that they think, I, I mean, I'll be honest, I foolishly thought that like the sales will just come to me, right? Yeah. Like you, you run an ad and things will just start happening your way. But really you need to perfect the art of selling. And, and yeah. really, if you really want to be a brand that people talk about, you need to invest in your first customers, invest in those relationships and get people to buy you initially, right? It's not, it's not as easy as it sounds and you need to have that skill. So second thing, so that's number one, you need to have the skill to sell, uh, to do sales, right? And when, I, when we say sales, we mean hardcore talking to people face-to-face can you sell a product, right? And that's a skill that I think people think you just run a Facebook ad, you do this, do that, and things will just start 
pop in for you. And sure, yeah, like there are examples of that. Like it's, uh, it. I'm sure it works for some people, but at the same time, you need to have this skill so that, you know, any place you go, you're ready to sell, right? You might meet someone that has the problem that your company solves. And if you're not able to sell it, it doesn't matter how good your branding online is. They're there with you in front of you face to face and you can't communicate your value. That's a serious problem for your brand. Second thing for the audience that I want to nail down is again, the, the, the concept that perception and how we perceive things often leads us to do irrational things, right? So if people actually take a look at how much they're paying, like in that members mark example, they would do something else, but they're not looking at, you know, these things. So I think the point here is that oftentimes a brand and the associations you make around a brand serve as shortcuts for decision-making, right? We, we think Harvard is a good school. Someone from Harvard is going to be smart, right? And we're making these shortcuts. We're making decisions. Okay. That person is going to be a good hire. He's smart. He's academic. He knows what he's talking about. Right. But oftentimes that may not be the case, right? And you don't do your due diligence just because you made these shortcuts in your mind because of the brand associations you have. So um, whether or not that's a good thing is another example or another story. But the point here is to understand that the power that brands has of having an effective brand has, right? If you can create the right associations in your target audience's mind, then oftentimes you're able to uh, get your target audience to do things that may seem irrational or like pay more for your product. Sorry to cut you off. Let's uh, let's continue on the story. No, no, that's fine. I mean, I mean, the one thing about it is I'll jump back into my dad's story, but what people have to learn is maybe your product might take off because of one ad. You've made sales. Now from that, you have to build sustainability. Now how to build sustainability is you have to learn how to make sales. People might buy your first product, but how do you make sure they come back again for the second product? That's where you have to learn how to make sales. Um, why is the second product needed? But, you know, back to my dad. My dad stayed in Panama for four years. Then he was trying to go. He, he moved to Canada and it didn't work out over there. There was immigration problems. So he came he came to America. He ends up in America. He lives in New York. He works. He actually worked. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, he worked at the famous the Nathan's famous hot dog stand on Coney Island. Um, this is back in like 75 or something like that, you know. Um, he was in Panama. He was in Panama for two years at that point. He came, then he came to America. Sorry. You know, sometimes these timelines mix up a little bit, but he came in 75. Okay. Um, he's, he's in New York. He doesn't really know anybody that well. And he happens to run into one of his friends who he knew from Pakistan, who actually I met today. He actually was spent a good bit of time with me today. Um, so, you know, he runs into him and my dad's working in New York. He takes, he's taking the subway and the train every day to work. And, you know, it's just, it, it's a rough life. And his friend moves from New York to Charlotte. And he tells my dad, why didn't you come down to Charlotte? Life here is a little bit better. It's cheaper to live here. Um, there's a few people we know, stuff like that from back home in Pakistan. At this time, you have to remember, there's no cell phones. There's literally, if you send a letter, it takes like a month for it to get to Pakistan. To run into somebody from the same neighborhood as you in Pakistan is like unheard of. And, he, you know. They, he moves down to Charlotte, North Carolina, and he starts working at an Indian restaurant. And he works there. Then he starts getting an education. He you know, starts working to become a machinist, working in CNC mill and CNC lathe machines. Um, and at the same time, he shifts over and becomes a, a general manager at Hardee's. Like, he works his way up. He works as a cook. Then he gets to manager, general manager. So he's managing all the Hardee's in Gastonia. Um, this is like late 70s, early 80s. And, and then he gets a start in his, uh, you know, CNC career. He starts working. He works hard for a few years. He's helping support you, his family overseas. Can you explain but, what CNC is? CNC, well, it's, um, it's a type of, you know, they have these machines. They're called milling machines um, and lathe machines. So what they do is you have to program them. My dad was a programmer. And when you program these machines, they essentially cut parts. And uh, I, I'm not saying I'm an expert at it, but, you know, I, we've done some back in schooling, you know, so you program the machine and it cuts out parts. So he was cutting major parts like he would be cutting parts for like 
machines and possibly playing components and different things like that. And he's programming these machines. That was his job. He'd just stand on the computer all day long. And they still have these jobs and they still pay pretty well. I think like now they pay like between 25 to 35 an hour. Um, so it's still it's still a job which is in demand and there's still a need even with all these uh, 3D printers and stuff like that because the art and uh, the expertise required for running a CNC machine is still there. So he's running these CNC machines, but he's working for a company. And eventually over the course, he gets married. I'm born. He calls his whole family here. Um, and it gets to a point uh, towards like the 90s, early 90s, where they're, you know, they're making him work harder, but they're not paying him any extra. They're like making him move stuff and do different things like that. And, and I remember my dad used to wear like a pair of dress pants and like um, like a blue mechanic mechanic shirt and that's how he'd go to work and he'd come back and he'd be completely dirty and he'd take a shower sometimes his fingers would be like bloody and stuff like that so he gets laid off and uh, at this point in time when he got laid off he had already started uh, going to the flea market and when we would go to the flea market he would buy and sell dollar items so our saturdays and sundays as a three four five year old were spent at the flea market um, Saturday and Sunday, selling dollar items, which we would buy maybe for like 30, 40 cents. People would come buy toys for their kids. And the flea market was a big thing back then. You know, people are coming, people still go to the flea market, but for different reasons. But back then, you know, people are still, you know, getting around. There's no internet. They come to the flea market. They see different things. They buy them. You, you might buy your groceries there. Like, you know, people might be selling fish and chicken and different things like that. And you get it at a cheaper price. So, you know, we're at the flea market we're selling um, different things like this. And then what happens is, you know, we know people, they've been doing clothing for a long time. And they're like, they tell him, my dad, they're like, oh, somebody, why don't you try clothing? And that's what my dad does. You know, he starts getting into like uh, sweatshirts and jackets and things like that. And when he started getting into that, um, they decided to open a store in downtown Gastonia. Now, when they decided to open a store in downtown Gastonia, uh, they rented the cheapest place which they could find. A and I don't know if you saw the video clip the other day, um, but it was on Instagram where there was a lady. She was some CEO or something like that for a major company, if I'm not mistaken, where she was talking about where when somebody wants to start a new business and they go from a, a company mindset that they've been working in a company their whole life. What they do is they buy they rent the nicest office. They buy the nicest office equipment. They hire the most skilled secretary, but they still don't know how to do business. That's, right, right. that's the wrong way of doing business. Unless of course you have a lot of money to burn. If it, you have to learn how to make sales. And if you have to start from your house, that's where you start from. That's where my dad initially started. He would bring a lot of shirts. Like we would get shipments of hundreds of shirts or hoodies at our house. And when they would be dropped off, um, you know, we would help sort them. It would be me, my mother and my dad. And then later on, my uncles joined. But, you know, we would just be we would be the ones packing them and sorting them and folding them. And, you know, it was at home operation. I'm like four or five and I'm helping out. And uh, so they got the store. This is like 93, um, 93, 94. They got the store and my grandparents would sit at this pink store the store the insides of the store were pink all the walls the ceilings they had painted the ceilings pink everything was pink in the store it used to be a ladies barbershop so you know they have retail items on the front and a few broken showcases right whatever you can buy cheap you buy it. you put it there they have a cash register and that's it and in the so, back hold on, hold on. they all sell stuff go ahead hold on I just want to make sure that yeah. the audience is following and, and just me as well just want to make sure I'm capturing yeah. this right so um after Panama, we go yeah. to New York, then we go yeah. to Charlotte and we're working at Hardee's. And then from there, uh, meanwhile, at Hardee's studying to become a machinist and yeah. gets a job as a machinist yeah. and is working as a machinist for a little bit, has you, um, other family is coming back. And then uh, at some point he gets laid off. But at yeah. that point, he's already... Uh, working or, or making flips happen at the flea market. Yeah, yeah right? essentially so, flips, yeah. Again, so I guess this is a, a one thing, the recurring theme here is that 
you know, the art of actually taking a product and selling it, right? Like that's <laughs> yeah. something that is necessary in business. And I think yeah. that um, one thing that we've realized and as we've created our, even like, like looking at a podcast, right? We thought when I started, I can speak about myself, not about you, but I thought we build a good product, people will just find it, right? But the reality is once you build a good product, you have to spend as much time, if not more time on getting the word out about your product, getting people to actually listen, consumer content. And so whatever the medium is, it's important to understand how to actually get people to take action based on what you're saying, right? Like it may just be a free content, like someone listening to your podcast, or maybe buying a product, but whatever it is, you have to have the art of selling whatever it is you're doing. Um, so next, he gets laid off while he's doing the flea market thing. And then you guys open up a clothing store in a pink former barbershop. Yeah. Okay. All right. Just wanted to make sure. Oh, so and, they, and, oh, okay, wait, wait, wait. Sorry. The the lesson for the audience here, as I said, I mentioned, I'll just kind of nail it here again, is that it's important to keep costs low when you're starting, yeah. right? A lot of times people will, uh, you know, spend all this money on fancy design, fancy this, that, the other thing. The important piece is try to get some sales, try to, you know, test out your product, get feedback, and you can always add that stuff later, right? I think people yeah. in the branding space, they, they feel like they have to get everything perfect right at the beginning. And the reality is, is that no one really cares. Okay. Like, you know, like it's nice. Oh, sh like, cool. It's awesome that you have matching this and that, but like reality is it, that matching piece is not going to make someone buy your product most of the time. Right. I'm sure there's some exceptions. What will make someone buy your product is you explaining to them why this product solves the problem they have. Right. And so I'll let you continue. Just want to make that point. I mean, I mean, one thing people f failed to look at or failed to realize is everybody looks at Bill Gates now. Everybody wants to look at Steve Jobs before he passed away, but they really don't want to look at where they started. They started at absolutely bare bones next to nothing. I mean, yeah, they were, they were, you know, geniuses in their, you know, in their respectable sense, but they didn't start off in a nice office. They didn't start off in, you know, this multi-million dollar manufacturing facility or anything like that. Um, everybody likes to look at Elon Musk. They're like, oh, they look at Tesla, but that's not where Elon Musk started. I mean, you look at all these things, you see them now and you're like, oh, okay, but they started somewhere else. They didn't start over there. So, yeah, I think um, to, to your yeah. point, I know we were we were having a discussion on going to some of these like uh, conferences, right? Like yeah. events where a bunch of people are coming and showcasing their product or whatever it is. Yeah. And one of the people we were working with was like, why would we do that? Like Apple doesn't do that. Nike doesn't yeah. do that. And I was just like, buddy, um, first off, they did do that. Like Apple has its own conference that it does, right? Like the Worldwide Developers Conference. They have a bunch of these conferences that, where they gather a bunch of people that are interested and they share their products. So they showcase what they're doing. Nike, uh, you know, when they started out, when it was Blue Ribbon, they went to these uh, sporting, uh, what's it called? The business like meetup or whatever it's called. And they showed their products there, right? It's important. And they made those sales, right? They, they brought test products that they were running and they sold them to actual customers. And that's how, that's a part of the process that I think a lot of people don't actually dive into enough is that like, look, you have to take the time to actually get people to buy your stuff. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's so overlooked and not talked about that. I, I just, um, I want to take some time here to actually talk about it. Sorry to cut you yeah. off. Go ahead. No, I mean, it's fine. You know, anything you need to add in, it's more than welcome. Um, there's always different elements and different ways of looking at branding, sales, marketing. There's not just one way. If there was only one way, Nike, Adidas, Puma couldn't survive. Adidas and Puma who came from the same, you know, two brothers. You know, the founders of Adidas and Puma were two brothers who got into a, essentially an argument and it turned into two multi-billion dollar companies, if I'm not mistaken. So anything can happen. So my my dad, you know, they have the store. They're keeping their wholesale storage in the back. And my dad and his brothers, they're going out on the week weekdays to different, different flea markets, wholesale flea markets, 
and selling items. They would go to like Anderson, South Carolina, Monday, Tuesday. Wednesday, they would go somewhere else. Thursday, Friday, they'd go somewhere else. They're like all over the place. And they would, you know, maybe try to be there Friday, Saturday at the store, one of the brothers or the other one. And they're all of them are going and, you know, they're going together and they're selling items and making sure people are not stealing. Well, at the same time in Gastonia, my grandparents are sitting at the store. And, uh, you know, theft is a very common element in uh, in brick and mortar that people do steal. I mean, it even happens online now. But, uh, but you know, brick and mortar, it happens a lot more. Obviously, there's physical items you can take. So, you know, they try to keep theft low. My grandfather's not really a salesman. He's never done sales in his life. So he's basically a maintainer. Um, it's... Uh, how would you call it? Like a check down quarterback. He just, you know, he just makes the check down throws and that's it. You know, he's, you're not going to expect him to, you know, throw for 500 yards and five touchdowns every game. Um, what Matthew Stafford is doing now in Los Angeles. Um, but what's it called? But, but, you know, that's what my grandfather's doing. He's just making sure that, you know, there's a few sales happening, but their main element is to keep this cheap store so they can have the storage space. And what my dad does is, he buys these cheap Dodge Ram vans, two of them, like huge cargo vans, and he puts them at the house. And so that's also storage space. He buys the vans for like four or five hundred dollars. And, you know, there's like this huge storage space now which can move. You know, they have one which they actually use and then they have two more which are just used as storage space. So, you know, whatever you can to get more storage space at a cheap price. So he's doing this and, you know, they're trying to make moves and they're selling urban clothing and they're selling jackets. You know, at that time in the 90s, what was really hot was like uh, college themed jackets. Like people were fans of the University of Miami. That was back when, you know, the University of Miami, the Canes were like they were the Canes. And then the Florida State Seminoles with, you know, Bobby Bowden just leading them like crazy. Then he had the Nebraska Cornhuskers. Um, I think their coach was Tom Osborne. And, you know, you have all these University of Florida, the Gator on the back, you know, these these teams, they had like really awesome, you know, merchandise. People were buying it like crazy. And remember, there's no online. So it's not like people can go mm -hmm. online and compare. And so one of the things which I told you before was we would have weekday pricing and then we would have weekend pricing. We were only open on Saturdays, not Sundays. So on Saturday, everything would be a few dollars more expensive. No one would ask why. Now, at this point in time in the 90s, people are getting paid on Thursdays and Fridays. Um, so they're, they're, they're waiting until the weekend to go make their purchases. So when they go to the mall or they come to the store, the reason they're coming is to buy. They're, they have cash in their hand. There's Credit cards aren't as you know, widely used. People aren't using checks like that. Everybody's using cash. So they're coming in to spend. And I'm I'm like five, six years old at the store and, you know, the hat would say a price on it. And, you know, I misread it. I misread the price. It said four ninety nine, But that was a weekday pricing. Weekend pricing was like, say, seven ninety nine, So $3 mm -hmm. more. And the reason you could do it is because it didn't matter. People aren't going. They're not pulling out their phone like, oh, okay, it's like. Oh, it's only three ninety on Amazon. There's no Amazon. Well, there might have been Amazon, but it's not the same Amazon we have now. It was yeah. Jeff Bezos selling a few books or something like that. Um, so then, you know, people are, you know, coming in. They're buying jackets, shirts, whatever they need, right? And uh, we're we're basically we're in downtown. We're selling urban clothing. People know they can get it at a decent price. Now, the other thing about being in downtown is people now no, my uncle told me this he passed away a few years ago he said people who are you know uh what do you call it larger sized um what is it called plus sized i guess if you want to put it that way big and tall big and tall that's what they call it people of the big and tall size don't like going to malls why because when they go to malls there's kids there and kids make fun of them so they like coming to downtown stores where there's not many people around and they can comfortably shop so you brand yourself to make sure people like that come in. So you have all mm. sizes. And the guy beside us, his store was called Mr. K Big and Tall. He was selling suits for big and tall men. We were selling shirts and pants and shorts for all sized men. Okay. Mm. So, so, you know, people, go ahead. Yeah, really important point here. I just <laughs> wanted to take a step back uh, and make sure the audience is getting this. So, and myself as well. 
uh, it's really important to understand who your customer is and what drives them, right? And so what a couple of things that also I mentioned. So first thing is that people are into these sports teams. And so making sure that you have products that are appealing to those customers, right? So that's the first thing. Second thing is that a lot, there's a big and tall store next door and big and tall people like to shop uh, at these downtown stores. And so understanding these elements, you can have the right product mix there so that when the customer comes in with the intent to buy, you get the sale rather than them walking out disappointed. I think that's really important in all aspects, understanding who your customer is, who your target audience is and creating the product mix for them. All right, sorry, go ahead. I mean, you got to strike when the iron is hot. You can't wait. Um, so when those customers walk in, what they want, what they need, you got to make sure you make the sales. There might not be a second chance again. And especially, you know, when you're starting off, you want to make sure the customer is happy. Um, and we also used to sell a lot of, not not a lot of different teams, but, you know, NFL gear. Like, you know, we would have Dallas Cowboys jackets. And this is back in the day when, you know, Troy Aikman, Michael Irvin, Deion Sanders, Emmett Smith, um, what's it called? Jimmy Johnson, you know, people are coming in and buying Cowboys jackets. People are coming in and buying San Francisco, Bill Walsh, um, Steve Young, Joe Montana had left. People are buying their jackets. People are buying uh, Pittsburgh Steelers because there's a huge Pittsburgh Steelers fan base over here. Carolina Panthers are very new. Um, what's it called? We had Kerry Collins, uh, Bianca Batuka, you know, different players like that, that people were coming in and buying shirts based on, you know, they wanted to be imitating them. They wanted to, you know, have that gear on. And, you know, it was it was a big thing back in the day that people used to wear starter gear. Now you don't really even see starter like that anymore. But starter was a big brand back then. Emmett Smith mm-hmm. was actually um, their, one of their, I guess, one of their athletes. If you bought a starter Dallas Cowboys jacket, on the tag, they would have a picture of Emmett Smith on it. You know, at that point, the Dallas Cowboys had just won three Super Bowls. Emmett Smith is the all-time leading rusher in the NFL. Emmett Smith was the man. So, you know, you're wanting to put on that Emmett Smith gear. And then, obviously, towards the end of the 90s, you know, the Broncos gear started selling because John Elway won two Super Bowls. You know, before that, Brett Favre won. So, Green Bay's always had a prolific following. So, you know, we're selling this um, professional gear, college gear. We're selling you know, shirts, urban clothing, all this was following in, following in, in a pretty similar, you know, atmosphere, a similar, similar universe where people of a similar taste were coming to buy this stuff. Um, but my uncle, he had, you know, he had different plans and he spoke with my father and my uncle and they were like, look, let's shift from this. The market for this is, you know, saturated. It's not as good of a space anymore. Let's move into urban uh, suits. Suits for, african-american men they had a different flavor they had a different taste they you know it was a completely different world and my uncle had worked for another uncle who used to do this so he had some expertise in this so we switch over all the way from urban clothing now into basically what you would call you know suits for african-american communities and there were two times in the year where we would make a lot of sales we would have to hire like we'd have like 10 to 15 people working um like on weekends Easter and Christmas. Mm. People would, from churches would come in and buy 50 to 100 suits for their church choir. And wow. they need them. They need the pants to be perfect. They need the shirts to be fitted, stuff like that. So we would get um, like different ladies, like uh, seamstresses to fix them. But at that time, they would be so busy. So my mother and my grandmother would, and my aunt sometimes but mainly my mother and my grandmother would be sitting in the back hemming people's pants and fixing people's shirts. And we would be charging them. And, you know, obviously my grandmother and my mother, they would just be helping out. And the whole day, the whole family is at the store. Everybody's at the store working. We would have other people working at the store. And we would be making like, you know, I'm not saying we were making ridiculous money, but we would be making so much money. Everybody was comfortable, like from our community coming and working and helping out because they knew they would get paid well. Saturday, you come in, you don't know anything about suits. You go up, you're like, we need 15 of these. We need 10 of these shoes and five of these shoes for our church choir for the men. And for the boys, we want a similar blue style suit. And, you know, you don't even know what you're doing. You just say, okay, 10 of these, five of these, you know, you're just getting it and you're selling it because that's what people want. 
at this point in time, it's not even about it's not about branding anymore. It's just when people want it, you just give it to them. You don't ask them any questions. You're not like, well, you know, this brand is better than that brand. You don't ask them any of that. You want it? That's fine. We're out of it. We can have it here Monday. You got to make a down payment. No problem. And, and they trust you because brick and mortar, the one thing people know is, generally speaking, I'm here Monday. I'll still be here Saturday. Online? Yeah, you, you can't go anywhere. Buy, um, online? They might buy it Monday. Saturday, the website might be gone. <laughs> you don't know what happened. Um, and it's happened before. Uh, I bought crypto back in the day. I bought a bunch of crypto on uh, Binsane. Binsane. And then, you know, crypto went crazy again. And I was like, let me check my Bitsane account. My Bitsane account's not there. They got shut down like four years ago. I didn't even know. So, <laughs> so I mean, I don't know how much money I had worth of crypto in there, but it's all gone. Um but but you know it, it, so people they, they know to come to us to get their suits you know this is different different you know stuff is happening there you for in business even brick and mortar you need to keep changing you can't become stagnant so yeah that's yeah. a that's a really good point uh constantly evolving another yeah. thing i want to just talk about that i think we just kind of glossed over is the impact of either seasonal things or yeah, yeah, I would say seasonal things. So I'll give you an example. Like Amazon makes most of its money in uh, December, right? Christmas shopping, right? Like Quarter just four. the amount of sales. What was that? Quarter four. Yeah, Q4. And that's Q4 is like, so you have Black Friday and then you have that month where everyone's doing their Christmas shopping. For most businesses, that is when they make their bread and butter, right? Now, the other thing, so that, that's like one seasonality thing, right? So a lot of businesses, especially in brick and mortar, even online, like your the demand that your site or your business is given is often influenced by things that are happening outside, right? And so it could be just seasonality or it could be other things like sporting events, right? Like the Broncos win the Super Bowl. Now it's important for you to understand that, hey, we need to have Broncos gear here because people will come and want to buy Broncos gear, right? And so understanding the different trends that are happening and being quick to react is really important uh, in terms of positioning yourself as uh, the place that people actually want to buy stuff. So yeah, let's continue. So, so we're doing suits. Suits are doing well. Um, so what happens is around this time is people from Latin America start coming to America, migrating. And and you have to remember, although a lot of times people may be really rough or tough on illegal immigration, back in the 80s, the Republicans had a debate, George Bush versus Ronald Reagan, where they were talking about how to give legality to illegal immigrants because of what they contribute to society. You know, now you flip it over. Now people tell you, oh, well, they came illegally. They shouldn't be allowed to stay here talking about the Republican Party. This is the same Republican Party, which everybody wants to be the Reagan Republican Party, but they have to realize that Reagan really wanted to legalize illegal immigrants, you know, in a nutshell. So there's an influx of people coming over from, even from Canada, but more, mainly from like Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Costa Rica, places like that. So they started coming in to work in kitchens, work in construction, work, you know, in different areas, you know, really hard jobs, working on farms, working in plants, which people aren't doing. They don't want to do anymore. Everybody wants to get into nice jobs, get an education and work in, you know, a nice office. So these jobs are being left behind. The Hispanic people come in, the Latin American people come in and they fill these jobs. Now, when a people of a different culture or a different society move in, you need to provide them services as well. And when a group of that many move in, they will require, you know, accommodations. So uh, at this point in time, this is when I go to Pakistan and we come back and all of a sudden the face of Gastonia and basically most of, you know, North Carolina has changed. There's like, um, what's it called? The grocery store, Latin America, Hispanic grocery stores. There's Hispanic, you know, bars and clubs and restaurants and everything. You're like, this is a different world. And my dad had a skill, which very few people in the country had at that point in time speaking Spanish. Yeah. So, so what happened is at that time, 
there's there's this huge thing which a lot of even Pakistani DC people, which you know, which we come from our background, um, people were using was calling cards. No, there were no real cell phones. Cell phones were minute based, really expensive to even call within the United States. Um, you only picked up calls if you really needed to, and you basically called after nine nine p.m. because that's when it was cheaper. Or sometimes they would give free minutes and stuff like that. You know, you have these like Nokia phones, you know, with the yellow screen. And and that's it. There's no Facebook or Instagram or Facebook Marketplace on there. But just you're using it for whatever it's needed. So Hispanic people move in. My dad speaks Spanish. So we what we do is slowly, slowly now. Obviously, now we're starting to move out of the clothing business. We're moving into Hispanic services. You know because my dad's like, look, we can make money. These people are making money. They're spending money. We should be taking that money because we're able to communicate with them. Or my dad is at least. So we, we, you know, we're still selling suits, but on one side now we have like coolers and we have like uh, check cashing. And uh, we would, you know, we would go for, this is one of the things I can remember. We would go for Jumma Namaz, uh, Friday prayer. When we would come back from Friday prayer, we would always be closed one thirty to two thirty without any, you know, without any questions were closed we come back there would be a line of 25 to 30 people waiting for us to open to cash their checks and we never took fees for cashing checks because my father always felt it was against the the nature of our faith so we would require them to purchase items of a certain amount equivalent to the check so uh he started we started getting into wholesale phone cards um calling cards phone cards whatever you want to call them and we started getting into um services like money transfer check cashing things like that and they were doing well with the suits but that was something you know it was a market where you know there wasn't as much prospectus to make as much money anymore compared to what was coming in now so they Mm -hmm. move into check cashing and you know now we've completely changed who we changed who we are we've changed the brand we're going away from clothing and we're moving into services and we see the potential of it because there's, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of Hispanic people living in cities now. Um, they don't speak any English at all. This is not the time when their kids are even, you know, going to school and learning English. Very few of them spoke English. Um, most of them didn't have legal status. Many of them were able to get IDs. This is back when you could still get an ID even if you didn't have any paperwork. Um, so they're coming and all of a sudden... My dad and his brothers, they started expanding into Hispanic grocery stores. So over the course of the next five years, they go from like one store to like four or five grocery stores or services businesses and all Latino based. Like their employees are Latino. Everything is Latino. Um, so there, there were some issues that came with this as well. Theft. Um, hmm. People would try to rob you because... When you do check cashing on any given day, you could even, you know, at this point in time, we could be cashing checks worth a hundred thousand dollars. And that's, that's a lot of cash. Uh, you know, this is close to 20 years ago. Um, so we're cashing all, you know, we're cashing all these checks and, you know, people are trying to rob all these check cashing businesses and stuff like that. But, you know, you got to take your precautions, got to be safe, got to figure out how to do it. We have grocery stores, they're running and they're operating well. And, um, uh, And the funny thing about it was all of our grocery stores, like two of them had like meat departments. We were selling halal meat, uh, Zabiya halal meat to Latino customers. And it didn't matter to them. They were still buying it. Um, And you could go to one of our grocery stores. Like we had one in Bessemer City. You could go there and buy halal meat. Nobody needed it, but they could go there and buy it. Um, So, you know, we always always kept principles in this. And the, the phone card business was going bananas. Like we would have these conventions, Ahmed, these conventions would be like, wow. You're like, you're walking into it. You're like, wow, what, what is going on over here? If you went in and you got some of the free collateral, you would walk out with like hundreds of dollars worth of collateral because the business was so great. Now, there were a lot of companies in the phone card business. What they were doing is they were spending money on marketing, but their product wasn't that good. They were able to sell it, but they didn't last as long. For us in the phone card business, we were a wholesaler, wholesale distributor. Hmm. We we got wholesale contracts from different companies and we were reselling their cards. 
we would make sure to make alliances with companies who brought in a good product with low fees. A lot of phone cards, they had very high fees. So if you made one phone call, it might give you a lot of minutes in one go. But if you cut the call, it might have a 50 cent charge. So let's say you, you spoke for 10 minutes, right? It only cost you 10 cents, right? But the fee is 50 cents for the call cut and 25 for a call. So if you got a two dollar card, you're, all, you're halfway done. So, mm. you know, they had those tricks, tips and tricks inside of that. So they would make fun of my grandfather at this point in time, he's still alive. And they'd be like, you know, Abba, you know, that's how you say father. Be like, Abba, you know, he only talks for like three minutes. Give him the card that only gives 25 minutes, but doesn't charge any fees. Because he's only going to talk for two minutes and cut the call. <coughs> if he uses any other card, it's going to run out in like three calls. <laughs> so they would give him the card like that. And, you know, so we're, we're very heavy into phone cards. And uh, this is can, the can I stop you real quick? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to take another step back. So, yeah, I think one thing that's super important here again, same concept is knowing your audience and like really being able to communicate with that audience, right? The distinct advantage that your father had uh, was that he spoke Spanish and he's able to communicate with this large uh, audience base that's that's their customer base that's there. Um, and then the other piece is, again, another concept that seems to be uh, coming up again and again is evolving, right? And so I think a lot of us in the branding space, we feel like we have to do one thing and that's, you know, we need to build that brand for the rest of our lives. But the reality is like, if you're running an actual business, right, you need to actually be evolving and adapting and understanding um, where it is that you can have the biggest impact and, uh, you know, keep the business afloat essentially. Right. So, uh, you guys saw the opportunity in calling cards and check cashing and that's where you guys pivoted to. Right. And who knows, things might've been different if you stood the, uh, you know, uh, kept it with the other way, but, uh, yeah. I mean, it, there's, you never know what can happen in anything. Right. I mean, what happens happens. I mean, you can't, you can't place a finger like, well, I didn't make this decision. This didn't happen. <laughs> You know, it, it's, it's, you know, there might be some hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in it where you're, he might have saved you from something else. So, so, you know, getting back to it, he's, you know, we have these grocery stores and it becomes too much. So they offload most of the grocery stores. They go back to only one store, but they're doing the phone cards and phone cards at this point in time, you know, they're, they're selling anywhere between, you know, this is still granted many years ago. Um, they're selling between. 40 to 60 million dollars worth of cards every year mm. you know a three man three man not three man they still had two three employees but three man run operation you know selling this many cards it's like you can't imagine like they never would have imagined it you know even 10 years ago before it happened that we'd be selling this that we'd be seeing this kind of cash um this kind of cash flow on a daily basis now obviously if you have this kind of cash flow you have to do a lot of paperwork to make sure that the government sees that you're doing a legit business and mm. they had they had the paper to back it up and they had the invoices to back it up so there alhamdulillah thanks to god there was never any problems <coughs> so you know the phone card business starts changing now cell phones are coming in there's companies they have uh unlimited talk and text now okay mm. internet's still like they're giving you like 20 gig, uh, not 20 gigabytes 20 megabytes some are offering 50 megabytes some are offering 200 megabytes and they're seen as the best ones and 200 megabytes is nothing right but, <laughs> we, but we we couldn't get halfway through our podcast with 200 megabytes <laughs> we couldn't get through halfway through our podcast yeah but this is this is things are changing now cell phones and we had started selling cell phones at this point in time um we were one of the biggest resellers for our retailers and wholesalers for a company called page plus page plus used to sell these little dinky little phones but they ran on the Verizon network, so everybody was using them. Uh, Verizon, at that point in time, was seen as the network to be on. You know, they had those ads with the one goofy-looking guy with the glasses. <coughs> Branding. So what's it called? Um, he's with he was with Sprint, which is now T-Mobile. Um, but uh, so we're doing we're doing phone cards, but now it's starting to like go down. We start getting into cell phones, selling cell phones, selling the cards for cell phones, prepaid cell phones, stuff like that. And we're still in cards or, you know, refills, top-ups, but we're just shifting now. 
now we're selling those more because the phone card stuff is kind of moving out because as you see people are able to use their phones like cell phones it's more affordable it's becoming cheaper to buy a cell phone is becoming affordable to use a cell phone. There's a difference between being cheap and being affordable and when it comes to cell phones. The cell phone is cheap. To maintain and sustain using a cell phone needs to be affordable. So you have both those elements together. And, you know, from this store, we're selling cell phones, like the one store, go back to the original Asad Enterprises. That's the name of the, the company. I never mentioned that. I should have mentioned that earlier. <laughs> My dad named the company back in 93 after me. We still have Asset Enterprises, you know, thanks to God, it's still running, it's still operating, um, and we're getting to the point of what we actually do. So, you know, the phone card business isn't doing so well, um, so, you know, they're still pushing a little bit, but they realize it's not doing well, so they, you know, cut their losses, okay, fine, let's quit cell phones, we, I mean, sorry, let's cut phone, calling cards and move into cell phones. We start doing cell phones, um, it's still fairly new. And at that time, my uncles decided that they wanted to separate the business, that they wanted to go their separate way. And so they went their separate way. And this is where I really enter into the business. I've been doing business and helping out my father and his brothers this whole time, you know, since I was five, you know, and now I'm 33. I'm still doing business with my father. So this is where we get into cell phones. And my dad, we have two stores. We have a small store in a small town and we have this one main store, which is still us at Enterprises. <coughs> and we we get uh, a Boost Mobile authorized dealership this is where the branding comes in people recognize boost all the other carriers are considered what you would call a mvno mobile virtual network operators so they buy minutes from major carriers they rebrand those minutes into a brand and they resell it so you have brands like h2 which runs off of the at&t network you have page plus which runs off of the verizon network you have simple mobile which runs off of the t-mobile network um and there were so many. Go Smart, which runs off of T Mobile. They had Univision Mobile. They just like if I went through a list, we just keep going. But they have a lot of mobile virtual not, network operators. So they're buying minutes. They're selling unlimited data stuff like that. Um, AT and T is not selling unlimited data, for example. But Net Ten is. Net Ten's running on AT and T, which is very weird. But you know that's the buy-in. They're trying to get people who don't have the credit to get under AT and T, and they're selling them this product. And mm. uh, you know they have to bring their own phones or buy their own phones, generally speaking. Or buy cheaper phones, um, but but this is when the internet on the phones is getting popular. People are wanting you know to be able to access Facebook, and one of the biggest headaches we had was people wanting to watch YouTube videos on their phones and running out of data. Like we ran out of data. Like yeah, you have like a hundred megabytes. It's like you're watching a YouTube video. It's like how long do you think it's gonna last? It's like and they just didn't understand that. And we're like, get Wi-Fi and use it at home. Don't try to use your phone for everything <laughs> so it, just, it didn't make sense to them and you know we're getting into we're getting into cell phones i, I don't know if you want to ask something i think now oh yeah i was just gonna add not um not a question but uh one another recurring theme that i'm uh, i'm noticing is that the evolutions in your business are always stemmed with solving the the problems you see right yeah. so um you know, you're switching from uh, phone cards to cell phones because now, like, you can't stay in phone cards because no one has yeah. phone cards anymore. Now the problem oh, is, how do I get a cell phone? How do yeah. I get minutes? How do I get all this stuff? And uh, I mean, I've, I've, I think I've been on the uh, on on the phone with you when you you've been at work as well, uh, yeah. and you you hear people come in and they always come in with a problem, right? People yeah. don't come into the store thinking like, oh, I don't have any problem. I'm just kind of strolling by, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so it's important to understand and clearly communicate what is the problem you're actually solving, yeah. right? And uh, communicate that so that people know when they come to you, hey, uh, cell phones, Boost Mobile, I need to go to also the enterprises, whatever it may be, yeah. right? So yeah, just wanted to add that on. So, so, you know, we're selling cell phones and I set up the store. The store completely set up by me. Um, I get in touch with a company called My Voicecom. I buy really nice outer boxes, um, nice phones, stuff like that. The whole store set up. And we we first started off, we were like doing, for example, like $3,000 in sales. And my dad's like, we're doing great. We're doing great. Like, you know, starting off new, you're doing good. Um, this is like 2008, 2009. By 2013, when I, you know, fully take over, our, our sales are like hitting like above 70,000 a month, retail sales. And, uh, you know, where 
at that time, the profit margin used to be much better than it is now as well. And uh, we're doing really good. I wanted to market us as the cheaper option to buy your premium products. Um, you could buy an OtterBox from us for 50 where you go to the store, like if you go to Verizon store or Sam's Club or Walmart, you'd buy it for 60 Yes, we're making less profit, but more people are coming to us. A lot of people, they have this ideology that when you go to a small business, they'll cut you a deal. That's why people go to small businesses to get a deal. A lot of times it is annoying because <laughs> here's how I put it. The money we make, we put on our tables. The money Walmart makes, Amazon makes, JCPenney makes, goes into the pockets of the CEO. The employees get paid to base rate. They're not getting any benefit out of it. But if you help out a small business, they're able to provide more for their families. And in essence, that's, that's the truth of it, that they're able to provide for their families. And uh, there used to be an ad all the time uh, on the radio where they used to say something. I don't remember. Some famous golfer used to say, small businesses you know, run America or they're the heart of America, something like that. So small businesses have historically been the heart of America. Um, that's how it always was. That's how I imagine it will continue to be. But we have seen a lot of loss based on this, you know, um, corporate takeovers of everything. And people have become systemically or systematically ingrained into these systems where business is something that teaches you to be independent and to think on your own and to think out of the box. But when you work for a company, they may ask you to think out of the box, but it's to think out of the box for them, not for yourself. So, you know, it's a huge difference. And that's why, you know, you take the example of Chick-fil-A, where it, it, in essence, it's, it is a, you know, it is a franchise, it's a corporation, but you can still see the CEOs on a daily basis. They're working on the company and the branding where there's, they're closed on Sundays for good reasons. That's their belief, but they stick to that. They know if they were open on Sundays, they'd make crazy sales, but they just mm. don't do it. Uh, one time when Jack Cathy, he came when I was at university, he came and people ask, like, what is, like, one of the keys to your business? He's like, uh, I forgot what it was, that they're supposed to greet you with a smile when you walk in. And, you know, and when you leave, they're supposed to say a certain phrase, like, thank you for coming or something like that. And he's like, that was the first thing my dad did when he started Chick-fil-A. And we've always instilled it in our workers. And I was reading the other day, if they don't greet you in a certain way, and the customer says that before the employee does, you're entitled to, like, free ice cream or something. It's something crazy, some dessert. So they've made that corporate mentality. So as a small business, we always made it our mentality um, in the cell phone business, sorry, small cell phone business to help out people as much as we can. So they come back and they appreciate us and to give them whatever offerings that we can, the premium offerings at lower prices. So, you know, this was my idea is like, let's keep the higher brands, higher end brands and keep doing it that way. Um, we did that from like 2013 to end of 2016, beginning of 2017. Now, what happens is we also got into the car business, so I wasn't able to pay as much attention. But what I started noticing is when when Trump became president, people started holding off on spending money a little bit. There, there was some sort of fear or scare um, because of the way certain you know benefits were given to corporations. Um, government aid was being cut a lot. Um, uh, so you have to understand the prepaid cell phone business thrives on lower income people. It thrives on lower income people. Now, when the lower income people decline to spend that money in cell phone businesses, cell phone businesses start shutting down because there's not a need of as many um, prepaid cell phone businesses. And at the same time, sales drop. And we saw that. So now what did we have to do? We had to change change you know change the pace we're still selling boost we're still selling you know boost is seen as a a brand which people can afford affordable brand and we're selling other prepaid brands but now on the accessories people aren't wanting to buy otter boxes because they don't want to spend that money <coughs> they still want to buy an iphone but they don't want to buy the newest iphone because they don't want to spend that money so now we had to shift shift ways which we're doing business now we're not carrying, we, we still carry nice iPhones. Like we'll have the 12 at the store, but we won't have as many. Like maybe before we used to carry so many iPhone 6 when they came out, but people aren't buying them like that anymore. Um, they may finance them and they may have to end up giving them back because they can't, they, they're not good with their money and they can't pay it off. But now we shift into cheaper accessories. Now we're buying similar Otterbox looking cases. They aren't Otterboxes. They may be Zizo bolts 
or they may be Guardian cases made by an unnamed company. Um, but there are cases which cost us like three, four dollars or five dollars, and we're selling them for twenty. Before we were buying buying other boxes for twenty eight and selling them for fifty. So you can see that the profit margin is less. The profit margin is considerably less, but the profit percentage is more. So now we're playing a game of percentages rather than the margin. Mm -hmm. No, before we were making less than 50%. Now we're making much more than that. You know, we're selling them, buying them for four, selling them for 20. Uh, tempered glasses, before we used to buy much more expensive, we used to buy the really nice, um, I forgot which brand it was, Nitro Glass. These tempered glasses were amazing. I don't think they even make them anymore. But now we're buying, you know, just whatever tempered glass we can get. You buy it, for example, I'm just going to give you an example. You buy it for like uh, 50 cents, you sell it for 10. Yeah, your margin your margin percentage-wise is more, but the money you're making is less. Whatever, you're going to sell more, whatever it is. But we're moving more into economy because we have to keep churning. We can't be like, oh, okay, well, no, we're going to stick to our guns. We're going to continue to sell OtterBox. Even if we don't sell any, that's what I'm going to sell. Now people just want cheaper items because another thing that comes in, a lot of brick and mortar are closing is because they're not willing to evolve. They're not willing to change the way they change the way they do things. What one example I've always given to people is if you go to these stores, which are local, like Old Navy, JCPenney, whatever it is, they need to start using these businesses as shipment and fulfillment centers as well. If somebody needs their merchandise, instead of it being shipped from like New Jersey to some customer in Gastonia, North Carolina, if all of the merchandise is as the old Navy store right here, just hire an Uber Eats driver, for example, and send the clothes with him. You'll save money on shipping and you'll do the same thing on the same day. Yeah. And you already have all the the real estate infrastructure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you, you, like you don't even have to spend, you know, Amazon yeah. spends billions and billions of dollars on creating this whole network and you guys already have that within like miles of, you know, hordes of the population. So it's a great idea. Yeah. I think Target is is doing something like that. I think Walmart's yeah. also, um, you know, taking that. I think we'll probably see some of these other. Walmart is doing it. Yeah. Yeah. We'll probably see the JCP and these other ones doing it too. I mean, JCP but I want to, I want to ask you Go ahead. A, a couple things. I know uh, we're already over the time that we had allotted for this, but if you have some time, I wanted to ask I you a couple more. more I have some more time. Yeah. So first thing I want to ask, before we get into the questions, do you want to talk about the food truck at all or no? Not this episode, maybe another episode. Okay. All right. So we'll skip that, save that for another episode. If you want um, to do a food truck, man, we're going to be crying for like an hour or something. Like that. <laughs> you know, we'll leave that alone. Um, okay. So what I wanted to ask you is you are someone that has not only like been in a few different lines of business, tried a bunch of things, uh, but I'm sure you've also worked with people, uh, advised people on business and stuff like that. What are some of the common pitfalls you see when people are starting up? Like if you have, so we have listeners that have small businesses, right? What is some advice you have for them for building their brand, connecting with their customers at the beginning and not, uh, you know, what are some of the just general advice for those people? Cost control. Hmm. Cost control. You got to make sure you're sourcing your uh, products at the cheapest price you can. And you got to make sure, obviously, keeping the quality, quality what you're wanting to sell. If you're wanting to sell a cheap item, that's fine. That's your brand. You're selling a cheap item. If you're wanting to sell a premium item, you got to make sure you're still getting the best cost. And you're not spending too much on getting a nice cushy office, getting nice chairs, stuff like that. Look, if you don't have sales... Nobody cares about your beautiful office because it's not going to be there too long. You got to make sure that you're making the sales. You can start off from your living room. You can start off from your entrance room. You can start off from wherever. You can start from a garage. That's where a lot of companies started. You can't focus on what people see. You, you watch Shark Tank. You see a lot of people, they're selling stuff from the garage and they become millionaires. <coughs> and they don't care because they know they're making money. At the end of the day, I don't want to sound too materialistic, but what, what is business about? Business is about making money. And if you're spending only and you're not bringing in, you're not going to be in business too long. So you have to learn cost control. When I took over the business, one of the first things I did, I put a Nest thermometer. Why? 
it cut our electricity bill down by a hundred dollars. That's what. Hmm. There's um, there's this debate that a few years ago uh, mm -hmm. happened. It got kind of big in the branding circles. Um, so a marketing guy essentially said that if your business is making less than like five hundred million dollars, you shouldn't be focused on branding at all, right? He's saying when you're starting out, you should be focused on marketing and sales. And so, I think that's a really valid point. And I wouldn't go to that extreme and saying you don't need to worry about your brand at all, but you know, have your logo, have your mission, right? Your, your team needs to know why you're in business. And that's part of branding, right? Like your team needs to know, this is what we do. This is who we serve. And this is what our target is. That's part of branding. You need to have that down, but now, you know, paying for flashy signs and all this, like, you know, things that are going to make you look cool is really, you're just signing yourself up for failure because those spending money on those, a lot of times you can't translate into direct sales. You may raise your brand image in the minds of some customers, but oftentimes that doesn't lead to actual sales until a very long time, right? So you need to have a good mix of short-term bets and long-term bets. Long-term bets are your things where you're, I mean, for Falcon Notes, I would say these are long-term bets, right? Like we would hope yeah. that the people that got these pullovers are going to wear these for a long time. And then this logo is going to be uh, shown and associated with high quality stuff for a long time. But we don't expect to get any sales from this. This is like a brand image thing. In the meantime, we also have a sales campaign where we have legit, you know, hey, you're responsible for getting 10 people. Like you have to sell this product to 10 people. You have to sell this product to 10 people. Create these relationships with those customers. Find out what they want, how we can solve their problem. Um, and then that combination is what you actually need to work. And in the beginning, you should be more focused on your initial customers, right? Really focus on what is it that your company can do to help that, uh, to help your customers, right? You guys have this talent, these skills, you guys are in business for whatever reason. How can you serve those initial customers rather than how can we look cool, right? I'm not saying all oh, branding is how we can look cool. That's a generalization again, but I want to make that point, right? Cost cutting is super important. You need to know like if you are not making money, you're not going to be in business for very long, right? No, That's just the reality of it, right? Like you can't, the business doesn't survive without cash flow. And so you yeah. need to figure out how you can consistently bring in cash. That's where you need to spend time and money nurturing relationships with people that will actually pay for the value that you provide them. Yeah. Right. And so, so there was this, there was this one cell, uh, phone card company. It's called 9278. Um, it was run by Pakistanis. Um, and their main thing was, you know, how they say sex sells. They were using attractive young girls as their advertisement material, even on their cards. Like they would have pictures of attractive women on it. And if you went to the shows at their booth, they would have attractive women. They spent so much money on marketing their product and especially the attractive looking women. They, they did make sales, but they didn't last very long because they were spending so much money on this marketing when their product was crap. Honestly, they were selling hot crap um, as a product where their f phone cards fees were so high for each call. But, you know, they were trying to bank on, you know, having an attractive woman on the phone card. What does an attractive woman on a phone card have to do with anything? It's like it goes back to the whole thing where Ahmed did that. And I'm not trying to get religious or anything. And he was trying to explain to people, what does a woman in a bikini have to do with the car? Like if there's advertisement for a car and a woman with a bikini, it has nothing to do with it. So having a, a woman, attractive looking woman on a phone card with horrible fees has nothing to do with the phone card. And it wasn't sustainable. The, the other piece is this. And so this is maybe uh, a topic for another podcast. But, you know, what they say that the brand era is over, right? Yeah. They used to be, you could, you know, have an attractive woman, have yeah. a picture of your product and put it on a bunch of ads and you will get sales. That yeah. era is done. Even yeah. if you had a moment where you had sales, you had a nice slogan, that's, that doesn't happen anymore. You know why? Because now we have Google yeah. and anyone like you mentioned earlier in the episode can just look up, okay, what's the cheapest product for, you know, you know, hair care or whatever it may be. Right. And so it's not enough to just have, oh, this nice picture here, I'm going to boost it out to, you know, millions of people and everyone's going to buy my stuff. It's not that simple. People now 
go and do research before they buy products, which is not necessarily something that was available for people to do, right? Like they just didn't have access to know all these different prices and yeah, quality. That's and one of the stuff. challenges also for brick and mortar is now everybody, what do they do? They see how much you're selling for, they pull it up on, they Google it, or they pull it up on Amazon. How much can I get it for? With screen protectors, that's one of the thing, things is people put it up on Amazon. They go, like, oh, well, I can get a packet of three for five, you know, $8. Like, okay, go ahead, get it. I'm not going to stop you. I had a lady come in the other day. She's like, I want to get my phone fixed. We we do cell phone repairs. Um, iPhone 11. I'm like, it's going to cost you like $130. I can go there beside the noodle place and get it done for 100 She's like, more than welcome. And, and one of the problems which has happened for brick and mortar and all businesses now is these online businesses giving these ridiculous return policies. And people are just, you know, they've become accustomed to no questions asked, just return. And they're doing that they're doing credit card disputes without any you know reason and they're hurting small businesses because of this large businesses can take those losses for a certain amount of time but even they have started getting smarter about it where they're not allowing these credit card disputes to go through but small businesses are getting hurt by these return policies and you see now because of covid um airlines are suffering because of the way people are acting Businesses are suffering because of the way people are acting. They just confiscated the largest amount of guns they've ever confiscated, the TSA, because people have forgotten how to interact with other human beings. So brick and mortar is hurting because of this, because everybody thinks they can just buy stuff on Walmart.com or Target.com or Amazon.com and just return it. With, you know, you can't do that with brick and mortar. We hurt <laughs> when you do that. So, you know, we have to let people know, look, you buy this, you can't bring it back in. It's not possible for you to tear it up and bring it back in. Um, so it's just one of those things is it's, it's, it's evolving and we have to learn how to live with it. Yeah. I think like to that point, you know, big businesses can afford to take those losses, but small businesses, like if you do that stuff enough, uh, it really hurts into their bottom line and, you know, the food that they put on the table, right? Like you mentioned. So I think it's important for us as consumers to also be aware and not have the same expectations we have of big business, which we rightfully should have those expectations of big business because they're making so much money and they can afford to do this and they should have those policies. But at the same time, we shouldn't have those same expectations for small businesses or we should be uh, people that are supporting and uh, you know creating that culture. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I know there's a lot more that we need to talk about uh, and yeah. dive into, but I think we learned a lot about brick and mortar branding, which is something that uh, it, we haven't changing. really talked about. Yeah, it's always changing. That's the thing about it. Maybe this episode hasn't been as focused as the other episodes, is because brick and mortar is always changing. L let me just give you an example. I don't want to take it too long myself. Look at Walmart. Walmart has a plan. Their stores, they change the way their stores look almost every two years. They'll change something around. They'll change the aisles from this way to that way. They'll change the, the flooring. They'll change the electronic section. I walked into Best Buy today. They just did a whole remodel. They took away the fridges, the dishwashers, the washing machines. They took everything away. It's an experience store now. That's, that's all yeah, they have. It's more like uh, like an Apple store kind of thing, right? Yeah. So they've turned the whole thing into an Apple store, essentially. Um, they said that's what they should have done with Toys R Us. But Toys R Us apparently was too arrogant to do it. And by the time they tried, it was too late. So I, I just, so, I mean, I've been to Best Buy. I've been to Apple Store. It's, they're still, they still got a lot of work to do. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I what you're saying, but it's a step in the right direction. Where oh, yeah, yeah. the way it looks now, I would actually walk into Best Buy. The way it looked before, I wouldn't walk into Best Buy. But obviously today I went in and I was standing and the guy didn't even say hi. I needed something. That, that's what I'm can... talking about. That's exactly the same thing happened to me. Like I went to Best Buy and no one said like Apple. I went to the Apple yeah. store in, in Chicago. Like they walk up to you. They walk. Yeah. They have people at like every single place. And then if you want to buy an Apple watch, they'll be like, Hey, can you wait at this table? And if yeah. the guy's helping someone and like, they'll bring the products to you, right. They'll yes. have the sale right there. You don't have to go to wait in line or anything. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's such a, we can have a whole discussion on yeah. Apple but, stores. But like the guy who was standing there, he is trying to buy some iPad or something like that. He's going to spend like $500. I was there. I was about ready to spend like two, three, two, three thousand dollars $3,000. And this guy's like paying attention to him. I'm like, you know what? Forget you. Uh, I'll just go. And that's what I did. We have to understand that 
like you mentioned, you know, we have to create experiences for each customer, right? Like the, someone comes into your store with the intent yeah. to buy, right? That's one thing that brick and mortar has that you don't have on the internet necessarily. Like Amazon, Walmart, maybe they have that, but like the majority of websites you go to, you don't necessarily go with the intent to purchase something. Whereas brick yeah. and mortar stores, you actually go and people are ready and, and in the mindset that I'm going to go buy something. And so yeah. that's a distinct advantage that people have. If you are in the brick and mortar business and you have to make sure that you are creating an experience for that mentality. Thank you, Osavai, so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Um, we would all be in touch to get part two and part three happening soon. No problem. Thank you. Now, Asad has two podcasts of his own. The first is the Straight Path podcast, which is a podcast on spiritual development. And the second is Kahani Abni Zabani, which is an Urdu podcast about being a Desi Muslim in America. Both of these podcasts are available wherever you're listening to this podcast. So check it out. I'm going to leave the links in the show notes. Now, as always, I have my key takeaways from this episode. But before we get into that, I want to share a clip with you from our discussion with Zain Siddiqui on branding a coffee shop. when there was like the restaurant lockdown in Arizona, like people were giving us bad reviews because we weren't letting people sit inside. But it's like, we legally cannot let you sit inside. There is a mandate in the state of Arizona, in the city of Phoenix, that we cannot let people sit inside the restaurant. Um, so like, even if, even if it is like completely nonsensical like that, it's like, you know, we, we kind of had to address it and like, you know, you know, keep in mind, you always have to have like your, your customer service mode on. Like I can't. If you enjoyed this discussion with Asad, I am sure you'll also enjoy the discussion with Zayn. Check it out wherever you're listening to this podcast. It is episode number 38. Now here are my key takeaways. Number one, brands are shortcuts for decision making. In the members mark versus Walmart example, people don't even look at the price because in their head they've associated members mark with a generic cheaper price. A good brand serves as a shortcut from having to make the decision of which one to buy. And number two, one of the main reasons us as family was able to build trust with their customers was because they knew the language that their customers spoke. They knew Spanish and there was a big Spanish population in the area. Now I'm not saying everyone needs to go out and learn Spanish, but you really do need to understand the language of your customer. How do they speak? What are the phrases they use? What makes them angry? What makes them sad? What triggers their emotions? Knowing this will really help you build trust with your customers. And that is all for this episode. If you enjoyed this discussion, please consider leaving a review and sharing with a friend. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week.